Hey everyone, Christy Wimber here, and i um, really glad that you have checked in to be with me today. And if you are, then I'm thinking that you have, um, one, been following stuff that's been happening in the church um, and coming out in the church that's not so healthy um, in various parts of the church. And you are wanting to understand how this happened, and you are wanting to understand uh, why, and you're also wanting to understand some differences in theology. So I have uh, obviously been in a position where one of the things that actually kind of exploded in the church is, you know, from a movement that I come from. And so, of course, I'm around the world. People ask me, people want to know, um, you know, how this happened, why this happened, can they do anything about it? I mean, it's just human nature actually to ask. And of course, I'm out there, so people are going to ask. And so I did my best to respond in the way that I felt like I was supposed to respond. And, um, and some people found it, um, you know, super harmful. And, uh, but for the most part, people were really grateful. And it's because um, silence never really helps anything. And, um, and people were so confused and people were so hurt. So again, um, it's not just about um, that situation. There's so many situations that have come out. Um, there's a documentary on the whole thing of Hillsong. So that's not news. I'm not saying anything new. There's a whole documentary on it. But what I found really interesting um, is that there is um, a theology and how many know what we believe is how we then behave. And so there is a theology that has been marked, um, that has produced some of these choices, behavior, function, um, model of ministry. And I had said, hey, listen, I'm going to offer, you know, some differences, some theology differences, um, so that you, you can actually work out your salvation and know the difference. And I think that's a loving thing to do. And to be honest, I am not a theologian. In fact, for the last 20 years, uh, in particular, I've had incredible theologians around me that I have turned to, that I look to, um, that I talk to. Um, about giving language um, to the scriptures and who are brilliant. Um, but, I'm, but honestly, um, I think some of the things I'm going to share with you uh, today, um, you, you don't have to be a theologian to actually understand this, um, to see this. And I think that this is one of my biggest concerns with the church is I am like, where is the discernment in the church? Uh, because so many people are surprised and so many people are caught off guard and so many people are like, what the heck's going on? Um, so let me just give you a couple different theologies that I think are marked by some of the things that we're seeing in the church where things are blowing up. And I wouldn't even say blowing up. I wouldn't even say imploding. I would say that God has allowed exposure. And so there's two different theologies here at work. Um, in what we have seen in uh, a handful of places that I mentioned in the last uh, several months. And that is one, we have the theology uh, that Jesus lived for us in his earthly ministry, marked for us, modeled for us. He was very clear about what we are to do as uh, the church. And I think sometimes the church complicates things that um, aren't complicated. Jesus came, Philippians 2 talks about that Jesus came that he emptied himself, uh, that he came as a servant, um, and that he literally modeled servanthood uh, to the disciples, who never got it, by the way. <laughs> so I'm not surprised, really, for today. They were with him and didn't get it. Makes me feel better. Um, but he modeled what it looked like to serve. Uh, his last message to the disciples and to us were to wash the disciples' feet. So it was all about servanthood. It was all about um, dying to self. That really was the model that Jesus left. In fact, he said, I can only do what the Father shows me to do. So that is the ministry. And then he said, go and, and make disciples. And so we have, that's the, the ministry model of Jesus, so to speak, where he saw the inbreaking of the kingdom. The inbreaking of the kingdom is where I can only do what the Father is doing. Uh, and then he obeyed it. He didn't go ahead of it. He, he went out on the boat. He went to get away from the people so that he could just be with the Father uh, to hear. And then that's what he did. He did not actually, and I think this is really important to understand the difference here. He was in, he came in a time where the, the Ro Roman Empire was massive. It was powerful. It was 
um, you know, it was all consuming. And here the people thought Jesus was coming, a king was coming, and that he was going to set them right. And then he was going to, you know, get rid of all these mean people and these abusive people and these powerful people. And that Jesus was going to establish his kingdom. And then they, they would have a position. And Jesus didn't do that. He came in on a donkey. Um, and he came in a manger. And he came, as I said in Philippians 2, where he came to serve. So he did not do what the people wanted him to do. He came to serve. He didn't heal everyone. He walked away from people. Um, he did not, you know, uh, model, uh, you know, some of this stuff that we're teaching today this, that I think is just so damaging. We're just seeing some of the fruit of it. So let's know the difference. So that in the summary is the model of Jesus. And I'm a believer that we're in between times. The kingdom of God is advancing, but we're in between where, yes, we have the power of the cross and the resurrection. We know who wins. Um, but until Christ comes again, we're in between this time and in between this time we're in a battle and in battle people get hurt and in battle people die and in battle um you know like there's some victories and then there's some you know think losses that's what battle is and that's i think the in between there's a tension here there's a mystery here the bible talks a lot about mystery um and we don't like that as the church, we don't like the, ministry, the mystery. We like all the answers and we like everything to happen now. So part of this other theology, and I would give it language as in a conquer theology. So you have the servanthood theology and then you have this conquer theology. Um, and this conquer theology, I would actually even put into the language of empire building and enterprise because that's how it works. That's how it operates. Um, that's how it manifests itself. Uh, and so we, we just want to know like how it's not like hidden. That's a, that's the whole thing here. I'm like, this is not hidden. This is like for all of us to see. Um, and I think that's a tough word to hear. I think it's a tough word to hear conquer, uh, like in the church or empire or enterprise, but call it for what it is. Um, because that is what we're dealing with. And it's, it's important that we educate ourselves and it's important that we learn ourselves and that we're also teaching other people. But I'm going to give you some examples of how this operates and the fruit of it. And some of you that are listening, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, this is what I'm encountering uh, from both theologies. And it's going to help you and it's going to challenge you and it's going to educate you. And my encouragement to you is to take before Jesus and ask Jesus what's true. Okay, that's, I think we need, need to land there. One of the fruits of um, a conquer sort of theology is that if God told me, therefore it is. There's no dialogue. There's no conversation. There's no conversation because this theology is set up and it uses the fivefold, um, you know, ministry, which I actually believe in, but not like this. It, it believes that the apostles are untouchable. It believes that they are, you know, they they put themselves in a position where they are to never be questioned. Um, I've seen this many times over. So this isn't like, again, hidden. This is how it functions. And that the, the apostle and the prophet, and, and honestly, that there's this whole thing of honor. and But it puts man in a position that man should never be. And it's why we see so many people like falling off that pedestal because we're not made for pedestals. Um, but that is the theology, is that, that the, the possible apostle, whatever he says, it is. And so if you think of yourself as an apostle, and how many know anybody can go to the store and actually get cards and make yourself a title, say, I'm an apostle. Like so many people hand out cards of what title they have. doesn't mean they have it. doesn't mean that's what God's doing. In fact, there's lots of apostles, I think, around the world, but they don't have the time to actually claim as apostles because they're so busy being apostles. And if you look at apostles in the church, actually, they're the ones who bring the gospel they are the ones who set the church right. They, they are the ones who actually bring people together and they multiply the church. They are massive church planters. So there's lots of apostles around the world. But this theology in particular is more of a platform apostle. And when somebody says, God told me, and they see themselves in a certain light, there is no questioning that. In fact, questioning is to question the man of God. And not a lot of women in there either. But it's like to question that person is to question God. I'm telling you, it is that serious and it, that is how it operates. But it's not scriptural. Proverbs 8, uh, 2018 says, plans succeed through good counsel. We don't go to war without wise advice. And 
uh, the kingdom of God is war. We're born for war. Um, and we get counsel. The Proverbs is full of verses that actually tell us that without people, without counsel, we don't succeed. And so it sets people up actually into a light that's not healthy. And so when God, when they say God told me, therefore it is, it eliminates conversation because here's the thing. No one wants to argue with God. When people say, God told me, it eliminates conversation, and that is not godly. And where there's no a healthy accountability and dialogue, what we create is we create independent, ego-driven leadership, and power without accountability creates tyrants. I don't care what label you put on it. If, if, if there is behavior that actually produces a fruit that does the damage of what I have just seen, and I've seen it many times over, but I just saw it in such a massive way where it has been exposed and it creates confusion, it creates chaos, it creates hurt, it creates pain, and it also creates division. And so real apostles bring people together. Shepherds, actually the role of shepherds, bring people together. We need to get back to the shepherds of the church. It's almost like where they've been devalued. And if you look at scripture and like what God said, shepherd is mentioned way more times than apostle. Let me just say that. And so where there's no accountability, it's not healthy. Second thing here is when somebody disagrees or there is any opposition, it's persecution. So you can't really say anything because they've set themselves up. Like, if God's told me this, this is God. And if you speak against me, it just shows that this is God all the more. Because look at the persecution. So they'll tell the people, look at all the persecution. Look at all the opposition. Do you see how everything is twisted? But I'm going to tell you, my friends, there is a big difference between persecution and consequence. And what we are seeing in the church is not persecution Exposure in the church of what's happening in all these places is not is not persecution. This is consequence. It is consequence of here's the thing of what we have empowered in the church. So I said this in my videos when I was even saying about, you know, people that get, you know, I like came in, they, they took a founding church, they took it out of the, the movement, they took lots of money, lots of money, lots of, you know, selfish choices, and all that. But here's the thing, it was empowered. And what these what 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 people do is when they have a conquer theology, they have to look for people that they can manipulate, and they found them. And what they do is they give them a little bit of money, and they give them position. And I'm telling you, this is if you do the research, this is what's happened. And they give them power, they give them position, they make them promise. It's almost like they come in on a white horse, and they're going to save the church. They're going to save everything. So so the people buy into it, and the discernment goes out the door. The discernment goes out the window. So this is empowered. The only way we see the fruit that we're seeing in the church is because it was empowered by the leadership. It was empowered by the elders. It was empowered by the people. And we as the church have to stop empowering this stuff because the fruit of it is so damaging. I can't tell you how damaging this is. I know so many of you are actually listening to this knowing how damaging this is. So you can't say anything in this context because every point of of opposition is warfare. And so everything just gets twisted. It's very, very confusing. And so that posture of, you know, kind of like being questioned, it, it just, it's not, it doesn't happen. But here's the thing we find in the scriptures where God raises people up. Remember the prophet Jeremiah, where God called him into the system and he, and he was called to speak to the, the people of God in the system. And he said, do not be deceived. And do not use the temple of the Lord. And you know the, the people's response? Kill the messenger. Like that's what we do. We kill the messenger. So when God raises people up and they're like, hello, like this is what's happening. You know what we do as the church? We kill the messenger because we don't like it. It's uncomfortable. It shows us where we failed, where we weren't discerning. And my encouragement to you is like one of the best ways that we grow up as the church is we acknowledge what we are missing. And I'm telling you, this, the, this, this whole thing I'm sharing Two decades ago, I went to parts of the church and said, this is a theology that's coming back into the church. It is very damaging. We're going to see the fruit of it. It's going to be super hurtful to the church. And you know what? They didn't listen to me. It's not about me. I'm used to that. I'm used to people blowing me off left and right. But I knew it back then. And I, I, it broke my heart because I knew that we were going to come into a day 
when the fruit of this was going to be so incredibly uh, hurtful. I didn't know it was going to hurt. It hit me this close to home. I'll tell you that. Um, and it hurts me, but actually I'm fine because I knew it was coming. Um, it hurts me for the people that I love. And the people that I see are all over the place, confused and trying to like, you know, navigate chaos, which really doesn't work. The third thing is, is the see all the G focuses on more building leaders rather than disciples. Hello, red flag, not the, mo the model of Jesus. Jesus didn't come in and say, hey, I need to build a, le a leadership you know, group. I need leaders to take over the earth. What he did is he said, I need servants. I need disciples. Our call of the church is not to create leaders. Our call of the church is to create disciples. Disciples actually being formed in the right way become incredible leaders. But when we have that backwards, we're all about position. We're all about power. We're, at, we're, we're leaders. So leaders, you know why this theology is like this? It's because the leaders are taking over what's powerful in the world. So leaders take over the entertainment industry. Leaders take over the, the political system. Leaders take over, do you see? And we're going to position ourselves for power. It is the opposite model of what Jesus left for us. He said, go and serve the least of these. Go and serve those who actually don't serve you back. There's nothing about, uh, you know, kind of building ourselves for position or power or taking conquering, you know, systems in society. There's nothing about that. That's all man-made theology. The fourth thing is, is that there's an emphasis uh, that we have the power, I have the power to create heaven on earth. Now, this is a big one. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord, are you sure you want me to say this? But yeah, because it's part of this theology and it, it's not hidden, you know, again. But the, this theology is that we actually have the power. I have, Christy has the power to change the atmosphere. I have the power to pull heaven down into my existence. I want to tell you this. First of all, I don't want that responsibility. <laughs> I do not want the responsibility that I have to make heaven happen in this atmosphere. No way. I am not strong enough. I am not powerful enough. And here's the thing, this is not heaven. This better not be heaven. Because if this is heaven, I should look better. And if this is heaven, there shouldn't be what we're dealing with. And this whole thing that we have the power, I have the power to change the atmosphere. No, we don't. We do not have anything without Jesus. What we have is we have the choice to recognize that God's kingdom is breaking in over here. Oh, God wants to bring salvation over here? Great. Oh, God wants to bring healing over here? Great. Let's pray for that. Oh, God wants to do this over here? Great. That's what we have the ability to do. This whole thing that this is, we're going to pull heaven down here. Do you actually re realize the ego that has to be behind that? Because that is not the reality. It is not that I can change this atmosphere. I can yield to Christ and Christ can change Christy. And the Christ in Christy can actually bring change to the people around me. But I don't have any power to pull anything down from heaven. It's so ridiculous. We sing about it. We worship about it. We write songs about it. Our theology and our songwriting is poor in some ways because it's not scriptural. And so we believe in the kingdom and we believe in God, bring your kingdom, let your kingdom come. That is a posture of, Lord, you let your kingdom come. That's not a posture of, I got to pull that thing down here. Do you see? That's a pretty exhausting. But I'm telling you, that theology has gone like rampant through parts of the church, charismatic church, and it's even made its way in other parts of the church. And now we're seeing the exposure and the damage of that conquer because it has to use people. It has to manipulate people because it's building an empire. And whatever we as the church, my friends, whatever we build in our own power, we have to maintain. And whatever God builds, he cares for. That's the difference. And this whole thing of that, we, we have to make it happen. That means you have to use people. There's nothing in the Gospels where Jesus used people to advance his ministry. There's no usury mindset. And where people are used, which I know so many of you are listening to this, and you have been through this, and you feel used. And people have like, you know, promised you, if you honor me, then I'm going to honor you, and you're going to have position. But it's it, that's a thing in you where you, you it's your ego that was getting fed. It's a manipulation, actually, of the spirit. It's it's very, it, it's very damaging in in different ways. But I just don't. 
I don't think this is healthy because behind this theology and what has made me nervous is that this whole heaven now uh, theology and bringing heaven down and all of that is that if God can do it, then I can. That's how it's made me feel. Like I feel like I've stepped into places where that, that theology is happening and it's at work. God can do it, therefore I can do it. And it has made me so nervous. I want to tell you, my, I am not God. And I am fully aware that I am not. I'm fully aware that I cannot do anything without Jesus. And some of these, they'll tell you that that's what they believe. But it's not how they practice. And you have to, and we have to as the church, look at the, at the theology and the behavior, the methods, the methodologies. We have to look at the fruit and what it's producing because the fruit is an indicator of what's going on in the root system. Isn't that true? So finally, the fifth thing in this is that usually in a conquer theology, you are going to find exaggeration. You are going to find exaggeration on how many people get saved. Exaggeration. Pastors sometimes just have this kiss, so you have to separate that. But you're going to find exaggeration in how many people get healed. You're going to find exaggeration like we have no disease in the city. We have like think we have changed the city. We have brought everybody to salvation in the city. You're going to find all kinds of of exaggeration. And you know why? Because they're trying to build a uh, reputation and they're trying to build a belief system that what they're doing is bigger than what it actually is. It's never as big as what it is. And here's the thing about the internet. With the internet, everybody's big. And with the internet, everybody looks a lot bigger than what they actually are. And exaggeration has become a spiritual gift in the church. And exaggeration, and here's the thing, you have to exaggerate because if people aren't getting healed, and here's one of the really hurtful things of this theology, if people aren't getting healed, then something's wrong with you. Because your faith is not enough because you should have the power to pull heaven into that reality. And if that's not happening, that's on you. I've heard all this stuff firsthand. Like people that I love have died because I, we dropped the ball. We didn't have enough faith. I mean, like I've heard it firsthand. It is so damaging. All the people that didn't get it. There's no theology for suffering. I tell you one of the stories that I heard uh, about one of these, these places that the Lord's allowed great exposure. And um, he literally put a guy up on the on the platform and said, you know what, you know, we've been you know talking about healing the sick and praying for the sick. And but I want somebody to come on staff that actually heals the sick. And I'm like, I heard that story enough times where I'm like, first of all, when you heard it, why are you still there? Why did you that shepherd is telling you that one, he's not a shepherd. And two, he's not safe. He's telling you that he has a his ego spilling all over the place. Because he actually believes that all of this stuff, that all of healing, all of heaven, all of the power is not just, you know, in, in the church. It's on him. And so he has the power to bring the right person in. And that is like a flag. That is telling you. When somebody tells you who they are, believe them. And when they keep repeating it, believe them. That is such a damaging theology. And I'm telling you, there's no theology of suffering in this conquer theology, because everybody has to get healed. There's no theology for pain. There's no thing. In fact, it's not talked about. And it's kind of brushed under the rug. Like that didn't that didn't really happen. And there has to be a miracle around it, um, because they have to maintain that theology to people, that persona to people. It's very sad, actually. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm going to finish with this, my friends. We have seen where God has allowed exposure in these places, where there's been documentaries, where there's been articles where there's been lots of articles and lots of things that have been exposed and God is the one who exposed people's agenda people who are aligned with it and one of the saddest things that I have uh, and frustrating things that I have learned with the church is that one some people will still stay with it they'll still go there they'll still be a part of it and they'll still think that what they're doing is the most important thing. And they're going to change the city and all that sort of nonsensical, you know, crap is really what it is. Um, and especially the young people is that they don't know because they get pulled in and they get promised all this stuff and they don't know the difference. They don't have the discernment to know the difference yet. Um, you got to follow that check within you because that check within you is telling you what's right and what's not right. You got to follow that because when you belong to Jesus, that check is God's spirit identifying with 
uh, with God's spirit that you belong to him and he's going to tell you when things aren't right. And if you keep ignoring that, it's going to go numb and it's going to go where it's, it's going to be like just not a part of your life because you're following another spirit. How many know there's a lots of different spirits out there? So the enemy has power to heal. Let's separate this. The enemy has power, period. So when we look at power, when we look at miracles, when we look at signs and wonders as all being God, doesn't mean that it's God. Just because something has good in it, this is why it's confusing for people. Just because there's some good in it doesn't mean that it's good, doesn't mean that it's godly. The enemy has power. Like we have to see things for what they are. We need the gift of discernment, my friends. We need the gift of discernment because the damage of what we've seen come out in the church and all of the people that have been on the side of the road who are like, I, I will never have anything to do with church ever again. Like, you don't think that that's happened? That's absolutely happened to so many countless people and so many people that it's going to happen to. And then we as the church have a responsibility. I'm going to tell you this. If you are a shepherd, you have a responsibility to say when things are not healthy in the pasture that you're responsible for. If you do not say, hey, there's wolf behavior around us, you're basically as a shepherd just saying, come on in and eat the sheep. It's very sobering to the shepherd and it's very sobering for us to wake up as the church and to recognize the fruit of what we are empowering. And the sad thing is, is that some people will still be a part of this and, and of this theology and practice and some people will actually be a part of it and they'll, they'll later down the road be super um, hurt, discouraged, disillusioned. Some people will never get it because there's always that group. <laughs> But, but the truth is, the damage, I cannot even tell you the damage that has happened. But I'm like, church, like God has allowed this exposure to happen. And the sad thing is, is that even when it's in front of our face, we don't even want to see it. We actually don't even want to believe it. And so, yeah, some people will still do it. But I, I find that really sad that you will be a blind sheep. And that's why sheep are not the smartest of animals. Sorry, but like for you to just play like this isn't happening or do the research yourself, you are not working out your salvation. We are in a time where we are bombarded with theologies and methods and methodologies. And if as a believer, you are not doing research of what you are a part of and where God has called you and the leader is not fully um, humble and servant-like, and, um, you know, just tells you what to do and how it's going to be done and what you're doing wrong or is building his kingdom, then, you know, we are all going to stand before God one day about how we handled um, what he taught us to do. We are going to stand before the Lord on how we acted as a disciple. Like, this is like really important that we understand this and that we are feeding the right things and we have to stop feeding this stuff that actually produces such damaging uh, behavior and consequences. That would be my challenge. That would be my encouragement. Those are some of the insights. There's more, but these are like scriptural. So uh, we just open up the Bible. Sometimes we just got to open up the Bible. We got to ask the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, to teach us and show us the difference. And he will. He's so faithful like that. So I, I, I want to say those of you that are watching this and you're like, oh my gosh, I just feel like I got run over and I don't even know what happened. I'm trying to figure this out. I just want to tell you, I'm sorry. As the church, I'm sorry that we have empowered things that aren't healthy. I'm sorry that whatever system you come from where it's caused hurt and pain and, but you got to cling to Jesus. You got to run to Jesus. Like the church is going to always be messed up in different ways. It just, it is, it's just what it is, what it is. It's people. Um, and it will always have weaknesses, um, but Jesus is different. And don't don't look at Jesus as or the church as you know Jesus in action all the time. Sometimes it's weak. Sometimes it's messy, like what I've talked about. Sometimes it's actually downright damaging. And I think this stuff is downright damaging because it functions from pride and ego rather than servanthood. And it doesn't mean that I don't love these people. I absolutely, so many people, I try to maintain relationship and be a bridge and to all the church because I love the whole church and they're my brothers and sisters. But being brothers and sisters, I mean, some of your brothers and sisters are the ones who call you on your stuff the most. And, and I think we need to do that as leaders is say, hey, here you go, people. Now you do the study and you work it out. So there you have it. I hope it was helpful. Don't send me too many mean letters. 
<laughs> whatever you believe, just keep doing what you're doing. Because again, you don't stand before me, you stand before God. And I do hope that this was helpful uh, for many of you today.